five seconds or five minutes? Are we on? Okay. <laughs> Greetings in Jesus, friends. Did everybody have a good lunch? So good to see you all back here. And uh, are we ready for the second half of our conference today? Yeah. Amen. Let's eat. Let's pray for our brother. Father, once again, we thank you and we praise you and we give you all the credit for all the good things. Father, we also thank you for allowing us to go through tough times in which our faith is strengthened. I know there's some people in this room right now, Lord, that uh, are leaning on you for every breath and for the grace and mercy that you alone can give us. So, Lord, I pray for them. I pray for those who are struggling in here today. Father, I know all of us have seasons and times in our life where it's just very difficult. So, God, we just pray for spiritual, physical, mental, emotional healing that needs to happen. And, Lord, we look to you as our source of strength and power to face each day. Lord, be with our brother. Minister to us through your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Open with me, please, first of all, to the book of Exodus, chapter 16. We'll begin at verse 14, please. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. And when the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat, and you shall take an omer apiece, according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. The sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much and some little. When they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. And Moses said to them, Let no man leave any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses, and some left a portion of it until morning. And it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. They gathered in the, in the morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat. But when the sun grew hot, it would melt. Give us this day our daily bread, of course. But now let's look to the Gospel of St. John, please, chapter 6. Verse 33, please. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Referring back to the manna that came out of the wilderness, Jesus said, it's a picture of him. It's a picture of of him, the manna, eat all of it, eat all of it. He's the word who became flesh. Now in Hebrew, in the Exodus, there's a word play. The Hebrew word for what is ma, mana, what is it? What do you mean what is it? It's what is it? <laughs> mana, mana, what is it? It's what is it? Okay, eat all of it. If you don't eat it, it's going to melt, and the worms are going to devour it. Eat all of it. God was angry when they didn't eat all of it. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus. Remember, according to John 6, we interpret the Torah, the Old Testament, in light of the New. And John 6 tells us it's a picture of Christ, the Word who became flesh. As we always point out, Jesus 
is the scripture incarnate. The scripture is Jesus in print. If somebody loves Jesus, they will love the word of God. If somebody does not love the word of God, it's because they really don't love Jesus, at least not the real Jesus. I remember during the counterfeit revivals from Toronto, Canada, when some people, some pastors in Britain were challenged, this is not scriptural. One actually said, God is bigger than his word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. How can God be bigger than God? <laughs> You're drawing a distinction that, Christ, that, that scripture doesn't. Additionally, we are told God magnifies his word above his name, meaning his son, the essence of his being being his name. No, Jesus is the scripture incarnate. The scripture is Jesus in print. The eternal logos, it's him. Don't leave any of it till morning. Eat all of it. Let's look, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 8. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone but man lives by everything literally in Hebrew by every word davar in Hebrew that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus is the word eat the manna he fed you the manna so John uh, tells us the manna is a picture of Christ. Deuteronomy tells us it's a picture of the Word of God. It's a hypostatic relationship. Jesus is the Word. The Word is Jesus. If people don't love the Scripture, it's because they don't love Jesus. If people really do love Jesus, they're going to love Scripture. When you see churches into experiential theology and basing doctrine on subjective revelations that they erroneously claim to be prophecies and things of this nature, it's because they don't love Jesus. They really don't love the real Jesus. They have a, another Jesus, but they don't love the real Jesus of Scripture because Jesus is the Scripture. <laughs> they have another idea of Jesus other than the Scripture one. If anybody really loves Jesus, they're going to love Scripture. They're going to, as Paul said, speak the things fitting for sound doctrine. That's what they're going to do. Well, with this in view, look with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 20. Paul's farewell to the elders in the church at Ephesus. We'll begin, please, in verse 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, that is, unbelieving Jews persecuting the ones who did believe. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house, he did not shrink from teaching them anything from the scripture that was profitable to them. Solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Be careful of gospel messages that do not place an emphasis on the mandatory component of repentance. It is a false gospel. The purpose-driven lie is a false gospel. In the purpose-driven lie, we are told, if you see someone living immorally or involved in substance abuse, don't tell them that they need to repent. We have to be seeker-sensitive, user-friendly. Just tell them they need Jesus in their life. And after he comes in their life, he'll clean them up. What Rick Warren does is he confuses justification with sanctification. He's confusing what the scripture calls justification with what the scripture calls sanctification. If somebody doesn't repent, Jesus isn't coming into their life. It is a false gospel. It is a false gospel 
unless there is repentance. Testifying to both Jew and Greek of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Unless there is repentance, the faith means nothing. And now, behold, bound in spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen there. Except that the spirit testifies to me that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel and the grace of God. The bottom line of life in this temporal world, did we fulfill that purpose that God saved us to fulfill, for which we were created and for which we were redeemed? That's the only thing that's going to matter. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Now be careful. Watch verse 26. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Paul is in part drawing on the book of Ezekiel chapters 33 and chapters 18. If you don't warn people, God will require their blood of your hands. He is alluding back to the book of Ezekiel. If you don't warn them, God will require their blood of your hands. We tell Christians, think of yourself as, a, as an officer of the court. Your job is to serve writs, injunctions, subpoenas. If a person is served and they tear it up and throw it in your face and laugh at you and slam the door, that's down to them. You've done what you were required to do. Now they're in contempt of court. Now they're in more trouble. You served what you were supposed to. God's word does not return void. Every time you tell an unsaved person the gospel, it's either going to count towards their salvation or ultimately count towards their indictment. They're not going to be able to say they never heard they were never told. His word does not return void. We're not responsible for their response. We're just responsible to tell them faithfully and in a biblically presentable manner the truth. It is likewise true when people go into error. Brethren in the faith, Paul did this. We are not responsible to make them correct their wrong praxis or their wrong doctrine but we are responsible to tell them whether or not they comply with what the Scripture says is between them and the Lord. God's only going to hold us accountable for having warned them. Remember, his word never returns void. Paul's final exhortation, and he gives a prophecy, is in verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers. In Acts 13, the Holy Spirit said, Set out for me Barnabas and Saul. Only God can ordain a minister. The Lord's ministers are ministers of the Lord. They are not ministers of the church. The church has no authority to ordain a minister. None. None. They may tried to ascribe themselves that authority of appropriated to themselves with holy orders or ordination or something like this, but the church has no authority to ordain a minister. When a church ordains a minister, they are only doing what the Holy Spirit has instructed. They are only confirming and affirming what the Holy Spirit has decreed, as we see in Acts 13. Only God can ordain a minister. The church has no authority. Now, by a minister, I don't necessarily mean a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary. Every one of you has a ministry. We don't all have the same ministry. We're not all in ministries of leadership. But God has ordained a ministry for every Christian, according to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. But let's continue. Be on your guard. Watch out. I know after my departure, in verse 29... Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, 
men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. People will come into the church, but people will raise up within the church. Savage wolves. Wolves in sheep's clothing, but wolves nonetheless. It's going to happen. It's only a question of when, not a question of if. If God is blessing a church, if God is raising a church up, if a church is growing, if it's growing spiritually, if it's growing in the fruit of the Spirit, if it's growing numerically, Satan is going to attack it. He'll try to send people in from the outside, or he'll raise people up from the inside, or both. But the attack will surely come. Don't worry when the attack comes. Worry if the attack doesn't come. If you're not being attacked, you're not on the mark. If you are on the mark, the attack's going to come. It's a good indicator that you're being attacked. But don't be seduced. <laughs> don't be seduced. It's how you handle the attack. Well, let's go. Nobody's blood will be required of my hand, says Paul. Again, echoing back to the book of Ezekiel. Because I declared the whole purpose of God. Eat all the manna. Don't leave any of it for the worms. Jesus is the word. Eat all of it. It's not for the worms. It's for believers. Eat all of it. God gets angry if you don't eat all of it. If you don't declare the whole purpose. Well, pretty good in principle. But what happens in practice can be very, very different. Let's understand what the scriptures tell us. We've spoken much about things like text, context, and co-text. Look with me, please, to the temptation narrative in Matthew chapter 4. The whole dispute between Jesus and Satan comes from the book of Deuteronomy. It all comes from Deuteronomy. All of it. Satan says, For it is written, and he points to a verse. Jesus says, For it is also written. When a Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door, they're going to declare part of the purpose of God. Okay. The Roman Catholic Church teaches part of the purpose of God. Talmudic Judaism teaches part of the purpose of God. But so do false teachers in the church. They all teach part of the purpose. For it is written. I got an email from John Haller this morning. And I read it. And he was talking about a guy called Andy Stanley, whose father is a man of some prominence, who at one time had been a pretty good preacher. But he's gone the way of Ellie the priest in the book of Samuel and not corrected his son. And his son teaches many heretical things, things that are just out and out heretical. But his latest is that unity is more important than correct theology, correct doctrine. That's what he says. And his basis is John 17. Jesus prayed we would be one. Therefore, unity is more important than doctrine, says Andy Stanley, and his father lets him get away with it. His father knows better. Well, let's look at John 17. This was his basis. He cites John chapter 17. For it is written. Verse 21. That they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. And they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, the world won't believe the gospel 
They won't believe in Jesus unless Christians are one. It is written! It is written! I've had other people say this to me over the years, pushing the ecumenical agenda. But now let's look at the text in context. Jesus in his high priestly prayer prefaces this in verse 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you've sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they may be one, even as you, Father, and I are one. Verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Then he continues, and he says again, verse 19, sanctify them in the truth. The requisite for unity is truth. You can be united in a lie. You can have a unity and a lie, but you can't have the unity of the Spirit and a lie. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. He's not the Spirit of error. Andy Stanley is a liar of the devil. He is working for Satan. You cannot have the unity that Jesus taught and prayed we would have unless you have doctrinal truth. Now, there may be secondary issues that different believers may not be of one mind about. Okay. But the fundamental doctrines of Scripture are not negotiable. The first thing Paul tells Timothy, the first thing Paul as a senior pastor and as an apostle instructs a younger pastor to do and be is to teach the things fitting for sound doctrine and shut the people up who are teaching false doctrine. It's the first thing he tells them. You're not going to have unity of the Spirit. You can have a religious unity. All you got to do is throw truth out the window, and then you can have unity. Now, this same guy, Andy Stanley, just as one example, he's only one of many examples, he actually teaches that our faith is not based on Scripture. That's what he says. And he says, we should rather emphasize the resurrection instead of Scripture. There is very little extra scriptural evidence for the resurrection other than the Gospels. Now, there is enough to confirm the Gospels. Some bits that Josephus said and some of the Roman historians like Suetonius and Tacitus wrote and things that, that rabbis wrote in something called the Avodah Zerah. There are things that confirm, that lend credence to the gospel record of the resurrection. <coughs> but how can you be basing your faith on the resurrection without the scripture? That we <laughs> Savage wolves will arise from among yourselves, drawing disciples after them. When they draw disciples after themselves, they draw Christians away from the Lord Jesus. They mishandle Scripture the same way that Satan did. We should be one! But he doesn't declare the whole purpose of God. We should be one in the truth. <laughs> one in the truth. Very subtle. They quote scripture. Of course they quote scripture. Satan quoted scripture. Paul tells us this in 2 Corinthians. Satan came as an angel of light and his servants will do the same. Yeah, I, I will say it directly. I hope for their sake they repent. But these people I've named, like Andy Stanley and Rick Warren and Tony Campola, they're servants of Satan. They are servants of Lucifer. They behave in his character in accordance with his modus operandi. They do the same things he does. Just eat the bits you like. Leave the rest for the worms. 
what it says. God was very angry when they did that. And he's just as angry when it's done today. He's no less angry. If you go to a sports university, a university known for its athletics, like Duke for the basketball or something like that, or Notre Dame for the football or something like that. You've got the students' refractories or cafeterias. But then there is a separate corner or room for athletes. It's not a cafeteria where you pick or choose. There are professional nutritionists right down to the amount of calories how many grams of carbohydrates, how much protein. The diet is prescribed. It is organized by professionals physiologically to maximize athletic performance. They work everything out. Krebs cycle. You've got to transfer carbon into energy. That's what they do. How much carbon? What kind of carbon? Protein, carbohydrate, lipids, it's all worked out. Athletes don't have a lot of choice. You've got to eat this, and you've got to eat this, and you've got to eat that. It is a physiologically prescribed menu. The other students, they can go to the cafeteria. We'll do the soup, but not the salad, thank you. We'll do the fish, not the meat. They can pick and choose. But the athletes don't have a lot of choice. Eat this. It's part of the regime. Eat this. It's part of the routine. You need this many calories. You need this many grams of protein. You need this much carbs. Eat this. We've got to maintain an electrolyte balance. Drink this. It's all worked out. Well, it's for good reason that Paul says we're athletes. Comparing us to Greek Olympiads in the ancient world, we run the good race. And to boxers, we fight the good fight. As any professional athlete knows, diet is an important part of the regime of training. <laughs> how much sleep you get, how much exercise you do, but also <laughs> what you eat. It's all controlled to make you a winner. God is the same. We run the good race. We fight the good fight. The diet that God has organized for us is designed to make us a winner. It's not pick and choose. It is not a cafeteria. It's not, I will do the soup instead of the salad. I will do the fish instead of the meat. We don't have that much choice. Eat all of it. That's the way it is. When you go into basic training in the military or Marine boot camp, it's right down to the gram. Right down to how many, to the daily caloric intake. It's <laughs> measured right down every day. In a hospital, it's not cooks who supervise the preparation of meals, it's medical nutritionists because diet is important therapeutically. Certain patients can only eat certain foods. Other foods are to be avoided. Eat this, eat this, don't eat that. Well, we're all sick. That's all we are. This fallen sinners saved by grace. The Lord is in the process of healing us. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. We're all boxers. Fight the good fight. We're all competitors. Run the good race. Finish the course, as Paul said. Declare the whole purpose of God. Eat all of it. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be. Man shall live by every word, not just some of it. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But people have their favorite doctrines, and they avoid other things. I was in Christ Church, New Zealand. I was there many times. But this is, I've been there since the earthquakes, but I was there before the earthquakes once. True story. 
And there was a big charismatic Anglican church. And the pastor was originally from Northern Ireland. His name was, well, I shouldn't say it, it doesn't matter. But he was there, and some people from his church were coming to hear me speak when I was in Christ Church. And they told him that they were coming to hear me speak. And he said, we don't want that prophecy about Israel in this church. It's too controversial. We don't want things that are controversial. They're not edifying. That's what he told them. Well, they came and told me. <laughs> so I responded to him publicly. Let me see. Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are completed. Luke 21, 24. Jesus said, the Jews will have to be regathered to Israel, to Jerusalem, for him to return and say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Baruch Kaba Beshem Adonai, in Matthew 23, 39. Speaking in the first person through the Holy Spirit, by way of the pen of the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah 12, Jesus said the burden of the Lord concerning Jerusalem. The Lord will make Jerusalem a heavy stone. All who lift it will hurt themselves grievously, and they will look upon me who they have pierced, crucified, and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. This is not to mention other things in the book of Revelation and the epistles that only make sense if you take the words of Jesus literally. It's not to mention the fact that there are massive, massive passages of the Old Testament that can only make sense exegetically if we take Jesus' words literally. Every word. No, that's controversial. Israel and prophecy is controversial. So I responded. I said, let me see now. You were a charismatic Anglican. You were a denomination, Reverend, that is ordaining homosexuals and lesbians. And you, as somebody who professes to be born again, is a clergyman, a vicar, a pastor in a church that ordains homosexuals and lesbians. You stay in the diocese under a bishop who does this. That's not controversial. You got no problem with that, do you? You'll stay in a backslidden denomination ordaining homosexuals. You'll be party to abomination, things that the Word of God directly condemns as perverse and unnatural. You've got no problem with that, but you have a problem with Israel, you stinking, worthless, hireling hypocrite. He took it personally. <laughs> man shall live by every word these contemporary events you see unfolding in the Middle East are exactly what the scriptures predicted would happen the signs of the return of Jesus every word Jesus reiterated be alert watch out for these things in the Olivet Discourse then he says it again, be alert, watch out for these signs. What will be the sign of your coming in the close of the age? Watch out for this, watch out for this, watch out for this, said Jesus Christ. I quote him directly. Rick Warren said, no, avoid in time prophecy, it's a diversion. You either believe Jesus Christ or you believe Rick Warren. One of them is a liar. One of them is a deceiver. Either... Jesus Christ is a liar and a deceiver, or Rick Warren is a liar and a deceiver. But you cannot believe both of them. Every word. Or just leave prophecy out of it. We don't want to. Oh. I knew a person who was a dean of a Bible college in England. And he was training people for the ministry. And he'd been years in a parachurch organization. 
Now, private church organizations are not necessarily contra-scriptural, but they're not scriptural. In other words, they have no scriptural mandate for their existence. That's not to say they're necessarily unscriptural in the sense that they're contradictory to scripture, but it is to say that they can't point to any passage ordaining their existence, where God ordains their existence. Okay. Now, a parachurch organization only needs a very basic statement of faith that all believers can agree on. We believe in one God and three eternally existing persons. We believe that the scripture, the Old and New Testament, are the inspired word of God, things like that. We believe that the salvation only in Jesus Christ. They've got maybe a half dozen points in their statement of faith. They don't have to worry about anything other than things to do with the most essential doctrines concerning the gospel. But Jesus told the apostles, teach them all that I have taught you. Jesus never said to make converts. He said to make disciples. That means you teach them everything. You eat all the manna. But because this guy came from a private church organization, he was teaching candidates for the ministry now. Seminarians. Don't worry about the other stuff. Just have to. He was directly contradicting Jesus. He didn't know what he was an ignorant man. Well, the fact that an, a scripturally ignorant man can be the dean of a Bible college ought to be frightening enough. But people like him are not uncommon. They're not uncommon. Every word. Eat all of it. My family being Israeli, my children are born in Galilee, my son was in the Israeli army and so forth. I was for a little bit, but my son was in it for the full three years and all sorts. And my wife's parents were Holocaust survivors and things like that. We have a tremendous love for believers who love Israel and who understand the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. We have a tremendous love for them. But you know, the New Testament tells us the ambassadors of Christ are those who preach him. It's the local congregations of Jewish and Arab believers in Israel who are his embassies defined scripturally. The scriptures also tell us that there's only one way to peace between Jew and Gentile is Jesus. In Hebrew, it's in Delich, the Hebrew New Testament translates the Greek beautifully. He is our peace, we shall be one. He is our reconciliation. The wall of partition in the temple, separating the court of the Gentiles from the court of the Jews, from where the Jews could go, is broken down. He is our peace. The only way to have peace between Jew and non-Jew is through the Jewish Messiah. Okay. Yet you've got a bogus organization claiming, calling itself a Christian embassy. It has a history of ugly scandal and splits. The people who founded it all left it on bad terms. Said it became something it was never intended to be. Claiming to be the Christian embassy in Jerusalem, but they will not preach Christ. They have a non-evangelistic policy. They simply say, we're here to support Israel. Social gospel, social programs, and political advocacy. But no Jesus, no gospel. That might offend the rabbis. That might offend the Saknut, the Jewish agency. That might offend the Israeli politicians. They're not the embassies of Jesus. Another calls itself Bridges for Peace. There's no peace without the gospel. They also have a non-evangelistic policy. There are organizations that have signed agreements with the Jewish agency. Let us bring Jews back from Russia, and we commit not to evangelize them. We'll never give them a new testament. By all means, recognize the prophetic purposes of God for Israel. By all means, stand up for Israel in the face of Islamic aggression. By all means, but not at the expense of the gospel. Find me one Jewish believer who is not glad that somebody told them the truth. And more than 90% of them were saved through the witness and testimony of non-Jews. We love you, Jew. Go to hell without your Messiah. Zechariah tells us terrible things are going to happen in the Middle East. 
terrible things are going to happen to the Arab nations that surround Israel, according to Isaiah. But Zacharias tells us that two-thirds of the Jews are ultimately going to be killed in their own land when the Antichrist goes on the warpath after they make a covenant with death. Oh, we just have to bring the Jews back to Israel. Why don't you buy them a ticket to Auschwitz? They need the gospel. They need salvation. Don't call yourself the ambassador of a Jesus. You don't present. Now, I don't say everybody has to do it in a high-profile way. Stand on the corner with gospel tracts in Jerusalem. Some people do, some don't. Expatriates come there, but they can still befriend people and share the gospel personally. But when you sign an agreement not to evangelize, God will require their blood of your hands. They need the gospel. Arabs desperately need the gospel. Quite a thing. Oh, but God's going to bring the Jews back and save them. All Israel will be saved. Yeah, the one-third who survives. What about the others? They don't want to proclaim the whole purpose of God, just the bits that they like. Quite a thing. My family is a mixture of Jewish and Roman Catholic. Everybody related to me is either a Jew or a Catholic. Or nothing. <laughs> the Catholic Church loves this. Unless you eat his flesh or drink his, my blood, referring to the Eucharist. Well, let's look at John 6. Let's look at the whole purpose of God. Let's look at what it really says. I am the bread of life, there he is the manna. Verse 49, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. But this is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And they go on, verse 53, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. See, it's the Eucharist. It's transubstantiation. No, no. What Jesus would have said at the Last Supper was, Do this in remembrance of me. Transubstantiation, it's a pagan concept. You have to drink his blood. The apostles in Acts 15 said, don't drink blood. That's vampire religion. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Count Dracula. Welcome to the Vatican. <laughs> they don't know the difference between Transylvania and the Vatican. That's a vampire religion. I don't believe Roman Catholics are cannibals, but they believe they are. A practicing Roman Catholic actually believes they're a cannibal. We'll keep reading. Verse 53, it's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. How can it mean what you think it means if the flesh profits nothing? He says, the food I give will never perish. I guarantee you, your Roman Catholic Eucharist is going to wind up in the Columbus sewage system two hours from now. His blood's going to go through your kidneys into a urinal. It's ridiculous when you read the context, isn't it? The whole purpose of God, it is also written. And so to justify the idolatry of the Mass, 
and the cannibalistic practice of the Eucharist, things openly forbidden by the apostles in Acts 15, under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What do they do? Don't teach the whole part, just, just part of it. Oh no. Man shall live by every word. I love this one. Look with me, please, to the epistle to Timothy. First Timothy, chapter two, verse three. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Oh, no. Don't you believe in the tulip? Limited atonement? He only died for the elect? No. If I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. They may not come, but he's willing to save everybody. He's the savior of all men, Paul writes, especially of those who believe. Yes, there is a distinction between the believer and the non-believer, but the salvation is available to all. No, all men means the elect. The word electos does not appear in the Greek. It appears many places in the New Testament, but it doesn't appear here. How do you get this stuff? That a God of love creates certain people to torture them forever? He creates certain people to torture them forever. That's why he made them. That's crazy. I'm telling you. False religion is a form of mental illness, and Calvinism is no exception. Now, I have no problem with moderate Calvinists like Spurgeon and people like this. I don't fully agree with them. But the more Calvinistic somebody becomes, the more crazy they become in their thinking. Its own history indicts it. From the Salem witch trials to the apartheid of the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa, to the plantation period in Ireland. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. We're the righteous because we're the Reformed Protestants. You Catholics, we can take your land. They did that. Why do you have American Baptists and Southern Baptists and Southern Methodists? They split over slavery. The Calvinists supported slavery. Even good Calvinists, like George Whitfield, he owned slaves. Somebody once protested to me, Mr. Whitfield loved black people. Yeah, I'm sure he did. He thought everybody should own one. He was a great preacher, but he was wrong about that. God doesn't create some people for hell. Jesus again said hell was a place made for Satan and his angels. God became a man in the person of Christ and was nailed to the cross in our place so nobody should have to go there. Oh, people are going to go there, but that's their choice. It's certainly not God's. Just leave that verse out. He's the Savior of all men, especially believers. Well, then how can it only be the elect if it draws a distinction between the elect and all men? Just leave that bit up. They declare part of the purpose of God. Part of the purpose. They don't want all of it. 
They just want some of it. Part of the purpose of God. It's almost unbelievable. Almost unbelievable. Look with me, please, to Revelation. Chapter 14. Verse 11, and the smoke of their torment went up forever and ever. In Greek, anyao tau anyaunes, basically translating the Hebrew olame olamim, from age to ages or forever and ever. This same idiom is used for the eternal high priesthood of Jesus, the eternal glory of God and for our salvation. If Hell is not eternal and conscious. On what exegetical basis can they be sure heaven is? Yet you've got people teaching annihilationism. People claim to be believers. In England, we had this guy, I didn't ever, never liked him theologically, John Stott. He was an annihilationist. Well, look what else it says. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. People who take the mark of the beast effectively sell their soul to the devil. They become Satan worshipers. They worship the beast and his image. Look at Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. Then I saw the thrones, and they who sat upon them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The people who take the mark of the beast are not resurrected in the resurrection of the righteous, are they? Neither do they enter the millennial messianic kingdom, do they? Leave that out! Erase Revelation 14, 11. Erase Revelation 24. Erase that bit. Just leave that bit out. It's possible to worship the Antichrist sell your soul to the devil, worship the image of the beast, take the mark of the beast, and still go to heaven. Erase those verses. Who am I talking about? John MacArthur. John MacArthur? They will come up from among yourselves. That's only one of his errors albeit the most serious. I'm only quoting him. Don't take my word for it. Go on YouTube and watch him say it. And all of the syncophants defend him. Jimmy D. Young, Phil Johnson, they all defend him. It's not what Jesus Christ said. It's about what John MacArthur said. They draw disciples after themselves. It's unbelievable. He's always on the warpath about crazy charismatics. We may have a point, but they're, they're not as crazy as he is. Nor is dangerous. It's unbelievable. Part of the purpose. Sermon on the Mount, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Very, very narrow basis for believers to be divorced and remarried. Very narrow. If you get saved after you're married to an unbeliever and they leave you and go off with somebody, there would be an allowance for that situation in 1 Corinthians 7. 
Some would disagree with me, but I take the text literally. I see an allowance. If an unbelieving partner leaves you and goes off with somebody, save for pornea, unrepentant sexual immorality. Now, even if, God forbid, your spouse did fall into immorality, it would be better if they repented and you forgave them rather than divorce them. But if somebody falls away from the Lord and is into that and they're living that way, okay. But that's about it. When I was first saved in the early 1970s, I've said this many times, I never heard of two born-again Christians getting divorced and remarried. I knew people that might have been divorced and remarried before they got saved and became Christians. I know cases or new cases where somebody got saved and their unbelieving husband or wife left them and went off with somebody. But the idea of two saved Christians getting divorced and then getting married to some other person? I never knew anybody like that. I didn't know anybody who knew anybody like that. That was the world. That was Hollywood. Believers don't do that. Well, they didn't then. They do now. There are pastors who do that. There are major tele-evangelists who do that. They're divorced and remarried with no biblical grounds. None. Jesus said you make her an adulteress. They're living in adultery. And every time they take the Lord's Supper, they defile his table and they eat and drink judgment unto themselves. But they're good tithers. But they're very generous givers and they're nice people, so we don't judge We'll let God judge. God has judged already. They're adulterers. In a bad marriage, and there are bad marriages, the last resort of last resorts for Christians is separation with the door left open to the possibility of eventual reconciliation. But unless they go off with somebody, divorce does not come into account. We don't do that. They shall be achad, one. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Achad. They asked Jesus the greatest commandment. He said the Shema. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Achad. The Lord our God is oneness. He made them male and female. You shall be oneness. The permanency of a Christian marriage should testify to the eternal oneness of God himself. My apologies to those who know this, but understand this. So much of the moral debauchery prevalent in modern society is an attack on achdut, on this compound oneness. There was a rabbi in the Middle Ages, Rambam. Moses Maimonides changed the meaning of the Hebrew word yahid, which was the digit, the number one, to ahad because he was trying to fortified Jews against believing in one God and three persons. Achad is oneness, Yahid is one, okay? God is oneness. Now understand this. There are different things that teach about oneness. We're Maggio Dei beings made in his image and likeness. Adam and Eve shall be one flesh. Oneness. One person, the consummated marriage, the Hebrew idiom is niknas ba, like in the book of Ruth, and he went into her and the Lord allowed her to conceive. One person goes inside of another person and a third is procreated. It's one in three, it's three in one. It reflects the Trinity, you understand? Marriage and procreation reflects the triunity of the Godhead. We're made in his image and likeness. Every one of us is one of us but there's three of us. We're tripartite. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Okay? Every one of us. You could want to do something, but you're physically exhausted. When you reach the age of 40 or so, you discover that your protoplasm has a mind of its own. <laughs> okay. In this fallen world. Won't be like that when the Lord comes, but it's like that now. 
Okay. The spirit has a will. The mind has a will. The flesh, the body has a will. Now within the Godhead, they're in perfect harmony. Within us, <laughs> the new creation doesn't want to sin, the old creation does. <laughs> There's always a battle going on. The flesh is willing, uh, the spirit is willing, the flesh is unable. There's always a battle between the three of them always arguing. <laughs> We're three in one. Why are we three in one? because we're made in the image and likeness of a God who's one God. We have a body because God has a body. The Son, Jesus, prepare thou a body for me. Even in the Old Testament, there were Christophanies. He physically manifested. When Adam heard God walking in the garden, it was Jesus. We have a spirit because God has a spirit. And we have a soul, a mind, because God does, who has known the mind, the will of the Father. Because we're made in God's image and likeness, we don't like to be reminded of our worst memory, our most painful memory. We don't like to be reminded of it. Because God doesn't want to be reminded of his. What is God's most painful memory? When to bring us salvation, his only begotten son, his monogenes on the cross, cries out, Abba, Abba, lama sabachthani in Aramaic, why have you forsaken me? There was a schism within the Godhead. You understand? When Jesus gave up the ghost, there was a schism within the Godhead. The Father became separated from the Son because the Son took our sin to give us his righteousness. That is God's most painful memory. What it cost to save us is his most painful memory. He doesn't want to be reminded of his Son hanging on the cross, begging him for help, and he wouldn't. For our sake. That's God's most painful memory. You look at the things today. The achdut was interrupted on the cross. Okay? What does divorce do? It destroys achdut. What does non-therapeutic abortion do? Destroys achdut, the oneness of a mother and a baby. What does homosexuality do? Destroys achdut. The moral depravities of the age we live in are all focused on the destruction of achdut, of the image and likeness of God being replicated through his creatures, humans, who are made in his image and likeness. God hates divorce. Why? Because it's socially destructive? Yes. But much more than that. It reminds him of his most painful memory. Whenever Akdut is interrupted, it reminds God of his most painful memory. We don't want to be reminded of our most painful memory because we're made in his image and likeness. He doesn't want to be reminded of his either. But that's what happens. No, no, no. Eat all of it. You must eat all of it. You must eat all of it. You've got people like Rob Bell denying eternal perdition for the unsaved. It gets worse and worse. Suppose somebody was to say to you, you know, Jesus is the Messiah, and he's the Savior. And he's a divine being. He's wonderful. You're going to love him. But he has a few funny ideas. He has this idea that people who are divorced and remarried without unrepentant adultery are living immorally. When he goes off on that tangent, I just ignore him. But the rest of what he says is good. Just ignore him when he begins talking that way. You know. Just forget that bit. Sometimes he goes off on these funny ideas he has. He's, he's wonderful now, don't get me wrong, we all love him, but he has these very peculiar ideas. So when he begins talking about eternal judgment of those who reject him, 
when he begins talking about these things, he's just, just ignore him. Suppose somebody told you that. Well, when they don't teach the whole counsel of God, that is exactly, precisely what they are doing. Don't eat that bit. Leave it for the worms. Don't deal with what he says about Israel. Leave that for the worms. Don't deal with what he says about the permanency of marriage. Leave that for the worms. Don't deal with what he says about he's willing to save all and hell was only made for Satan and his angels. Leave that for the worms. Just eat the rest. But you don't like just leave it for the worms. When Israel left it for the worms, Moses was very disturbed. And Moses was disturbed because God was angry. And he's still angry. Faithful leaders, faithful expositors of God's word will still be disturbed. It's not for worms. It's for us. We live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is the whole counsel of God. Nothing should be missing. Leave nothing out. You can have a favorite psalm or a favorite verse or a favorite passage of scripture. There's nothing wrong with that, but don't negate the rest of it. I read the book of Proverbs and I see so much is wrong with me in my own life, but it's God's word. It's convicting. I read certain of the epistles. It's very convicting. It's not comfortable reading, but it's the truth. I need to read it. We all do. Every word. May their blood not be required of our hands. Nobody's blood was required of Paul's. He declared the whole purpose of God. By the grace of God, may we do the same. Eat all of it. We live by every word. Thank you so much. God bless.